Welcome to uh, breakout section, session A. This is an introduction to AMD and its current uh, treatment. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mark Greaves to the po podium. He, Dr. Greaves is an ophthalmologist at, with Alberta Retina Consultants and an associate clinical professor with the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Alberta. He sees patients with age-related macular degeneration and is involved in clinical research testing treatments for AMD, something that you might all be very interested in, as well as other retinal conditions. Dr. Greve will describe the causes of macular degeneration, the diagnosis, and its treatment. So please welcome Dr. Greaves. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm very pleased to speak to you about um, a topic that um, I spend most of my day dealing with. Uh, it's probably you know, accounts for at least 40% uh, of my uh, practice. Um, I uh, have. I am a retina specialist uh, here in Edmonton. I've been here for 18 years now. Um, it's a fantastic job. I get a chance to try to help people all day long, and uh, quite often uh, these days we have a lot of success uh, doing that. So I'm uh, very excited to talk to you today a little bit about uh, this condition that uh, that does uh, occupy a lot of my time. Um, I kind of, I, when thinking about how to talk to you about it um, without slides, a doctor without slides is kind of, <laughs> we feel uh, without armor in battle kind of thing. Uh, we rely on these cl uh, crutches all the time. So I thought, what would be a good way to talk to you about this condition? And I thought, why don't I, why don't I actually ask some of the questions that I get asked all the time from my patients and, uh, and then try to answer them? Um, I'll probably have missed a lot of them uh, questions, and I'm really happy to, you know, to take any questions at the end, as Sharon said, um, and uh, I'll try to, you know, answer them for you. Um, so I th thought the first thing I would ask is what, you know, what uh, patients ask is what is AMD, uh, and uh, AMD stands for age-related macular degeneration. Um, it's an aging disease of the retina, and it affects uh, the very center of the retina called the macula. That's how it gets its name. Um, the, quite often, uh, I have heard patients come in and say they have immaculate degeneration, and I said, well, it is very nice, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's more related to the, um, to the location of the problem. So the macula is the part of our retina where the... Uh, uh, all the light is centered on as it enters the eye. It's where we do all of our very sharp vision. So it's very important for whenever we're looking at something that's important to us, that's where it's, uh, it's going is the macula. So this is an aging degeneration of that area of the retina. It has uh, many different uh, uh, factors that uh, cause it, and I'll go over a few of those in a bit here. But um, how common is it? Uh, it's quite common. It's actually the most common cause of blindness uh, over the age of 50. So if you're less than 50, we usually don't entertain the diagnosis of macular degeneration, uh, but it is a very, very common uh, condition. And uh, there are some speakers from CNIB who can tell you that as well, that it, it causes a great deal of their uh, problem or their uh, work with uh, reduced vision in the eye. Uh, is all AMD the same? And the answer is no. It's, uh, we divide it uh, into generally two different types, uh, wet and a dry. Um, and uh, this uh, you know, often confuses patients because you know, they think when we say wet macular degeneration that we're talking about you know, tearing of their eye. And so they say, oh, yeah, I have a lot of running of tears and out my uh, cheek, and I, you know, we have to... Uh, say that you know that's actually a different problem. That's a problem with excessive tearing or blepharitis or some form of exterior uh, irritation of the eye. When we talk about wet macular degeneration, we're referring to blood vessels growing under the retina. So that's really what wet macular degeneration is. It's uh, the growth of abnormal blood vessels underneath the retina. Dry macular degeneration is what everybody starts with. Everybody starts with dry. Some of them convert to the wet. About 15% will convert to the wet macular degeneration. 
So the dry type is where the tissues of the uh, retina and the pigment layer underneath the retina start to, gen to degenerate, they uh, thin out, they break, they crack, uh, and uh, eventually that can cause uh, damage to the retina itself, and that this uh, uh, causes uh, blurring of vision uh, <clears throat> for the patients. So the dry type, even though it's the most common, it's about 85% of macular degeneration, it only accounts for about 15% of severe vision loss from this condition. The wet is the much worse one. It happens uh, uh, very quickly, uh, and it accounts for about 85% of the blindness or loss of vision from macular degeneration. Um, so what are the... Uh, risk factors. Like when we look at a patient, you say, well, they always want to know, why, did, why do I have this condition? <clears throat> and the answer is not easy. It's, uh, it's one of these conditions that we think is multifactorial, meaning it has a whole bunch of different causes. And uh, these causes, we kind of divide them into two main groups, those that we call uh, non-modifiable and those that we call modifiable. So the non-modifiable, when I hear that word, it means, hmm, I can't change that. And that's really what it means. These are things that you, risk factors that you're born with, that you have uh, based on who you are, uh, that you have no control over. So those would be things like age. We can't control age yet. I have a lot of patients would like that. And I say, as soon as you find it, make sure you let me know too. Um, <clears throat> but age is the most, probably one of the most significant factors in this disease and the thing that we can't control. Um, and that's how it, you know, it has its right in the title of the disease name, age-related. Uh, we don't think gender has too much of a bearing, although it seems to be more common in women. Women tend to live longer than men. Race. Uh, it's more common in lighter-skinned people, people with uh, or from a Caucasian background. Fa uh, what are, patients also, also ask about genetics, and I uh, have some experts in the room here, Dr. Sove. But uh, the genetics of macular degeneration are murky, and uh, we haven't really yet found out everything I think that there is to know there. Uh, it does, I think, have definitely some bearing. Uh, there's been estimates in the genetic ophthalmology literature that it may be responsible for about possibly 15% of why we get it. Uh, there are some certain uh, areas that uh, um, the complement factors and such that, uh, that do link in quite strongly with macular degeneration. But this is a huge area of research. We're trying to find out from these genetic groups who gets worse disease, who needs to be monitored or watched more carefully. And so it's a very important uh, area of research in macular degeneration. Also, some people with certain genetic types may respond better to treatments or better to one treatment versus another. Um, other things, uh, cardiovascular risk factors, we're sort of sometimes born with those. Those can, can uh, uh, have some effect. But the most important stuff is the modifiable. Well, these are things that you can do uh, to try to help yourself. Patients... And all of us, just in general, really want to try to do something to reduce our chance of uh, a bad outcome or reduce our chance of uh, uh, worsening of our, our disease. So uh, obesity has been uh, linked to, um, to uh, as a risk factor for macular degeneration. Um, it's uh, something that we can do something about, and uh, we encourage uh, patients to do so. Probably the biggest one is smoking. Smoking is a very strong risk factor for macular degeneration. It affects uh, the uh, uh, blood supply and circulation and uh, definitely is very strongly linked to, to wet macular degeneration and uh, even to dry as well. Uh, what about alcohol? Um, some studies say that a little bit of alcohol, beer or a glass of wine, is maybe protective. Other, uh, certainly too much is not good. Uh, the the literature is a bit, bit murky on this area, but I enjoy a glass of wine, and I, I kind of like the studies that show that maybe that is going to be helpful. Um, and then there's the whole thing about supplementations, antioxidants, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, lutein, 
you know, these are there's a, a, a lot of good studies out already that show that this is probably an area that uh, is helpful. Certainly, there are a lot of dietary studies that uh, have shown that people that eat more fish have less macular degeneration. Uh, there's uh, some big trials going on in the States, the ARIDS trials. Uh, ARIDS 1 is finished, and I'll talk a little bit later about what that showed or told us. Uh, but ARIDS 2 is looking into the omega-3s in the lutein, and we're anxiously awaiting uh, their response. So those are the things that you can potentially do for yourself. Sunlight exposure, we always say, we'll try to decrease you know, UV exposure. We think that that uh, may have some harmful effects, but again, the literature there is a little soft. But it's something easy you can do uh, that may that may help. So another question people ask: What what would I notice if I had AMD? And a lot of times you notice nothing initially, and so this is why it's important to have a regular eye exam to look for that. Particularly if you're over the age of 50, uh, this is when it starts to show up. The earliest sign are these things called drusen. They're little fatty lipid deposits underneath the retina. And um, you, most people can't even tell they're there. Um, it's uh, it's something that uh, that needs to be uh, needs to be looked for. But if uh, you do start to have symptoms, the most common symptoms for macular degeneration are that of uh, blurred vision centrally, like if you're trying to look at something you can't see it, and distortion. Things uh, that normally would look straight, like a door frame or. You know, the line on the road, a telephone pole, it starts to have a kink or a or notch in it, or it's crooked or it's slanted or it's angled. Things are distorted. And this is a sign of usually um, uh, disruption of the photoreceptors right in the very center vision area. And uh, as it progresses, you can develop more and more blind spots in your vision, which uh, will blank out areas, particularly if you're trying to read uh, or look at something uh, intensely, parts of it will be missing. Now, if I'm diagnosed with AMD, how soon till I'm blind? I quite often get that question, and, and it's a scary question. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's very concerning for patients to get this label or diagnosis, and I usually start off by telling them that not everybody who has macular degeneration loses vision. There are a number of people that have a form of dry that they can maintain uh, all their life, and uh, as I said earlier, only 15% convert to the wet. But even the dry can get worse, and uh, um, usually it, uh, it does so gradually. We talk about progression of macular degeneration. To, uh, into the end stages, such as in wet, it's a scar or leaking blood vessels underneath, <clears throat> excuse me, underneath the retina. In dry, it's some thinning in the center vision. So the chance of this happening in 10 years, say if you just had dry macular degeneration, would be about 25%. So, you know, it's, it's significant, but it's not super, super high. If you had, uh, like, the end-stage thinning from dry in one eye, your chance of getting it in the other eye in 10 years is about 80%. So that's definitely progressive. Dry is, goes slow, you know, but it does, it can, it can progress. And if you had the wet AMD, uh, like the leaking vessels beneath the retina in one eye, your chance of getting it in the other eye in 10 years is about 55 to 60%. So they do, you know, not each eye is separate, but they are linked by being in the same body and having the same uh, experiences uh, in a lifetime of of, uh, of being uh, in your in your body. So if you are diagnosed with AMD, what test do I, the retina doctor, need to do for you? One, we check your vision. Uh, two, we have a look in your eye. We look for these signs of macular degeneration. We look for swelling of the retina. We look for uh, fluid under the retina. We will look for blood in the retina. We look for exudate in the retina. These are all signs that, that you may have the wet macular degeneration. If we suspect highly that you have that, if you have symptoms of recent change, if you have any of these signs that I talked about, we would want to do an OCT, which is a abbreviations for a test uh, called optical coherence tomography. It's like a little mini CT scan of the retina, only we use light instead of x-rays. And it gives us an actual structural look at the retina itself, and it shows us whether or not there's uh, fluid in the retina, whether the retina is swollen, if there's leaking under the retina. 
The other test we commonly do is a fluorescein angiogram where we inject dye into the vein in your arm and then take a series of pictures of the circulation of the retina. And this can show me, again, if there's leaking going on uh, in or under the retina. These are the tests that we use to plan whether you need treatment or not. So what's the treatment for dry macular degeneration? If you're diagnosed with dry, um, I'll say to you, I want you to monitor your vision, report any sudden changes. Usually we have you use a little grid chart called an AMSOR grid. It's like a little chart this big with squares on it. And if you ever see any distortions in those lines or changes, then I need you to phone me right away. And we get you in and we evaluate your retina. The other thing I'll ask you to do is go on to, uh, is to protect your eye from the sun using UV blocking sunglasses. And then I'm going to ask you whether you smoke or not. Uh, if you do smoke, I ask you to try to stop. And then we make recommendations about which type of vitamins you should be on to try to slow the progression of the disease. So there is a really big study that went on in the States called the ARIDS trial, and uh, it stands for Age-Related Eye Disease Study. And uh, if you're buying vitamins, you often see this on the, on the bottle. And they, uh, the first study, they looked at a certain collection of vitamins, vitamins A, C, E, and zinc. Zinc's a mineral. And um, there was a hypothesis before the trial that these may actually help uh, prevent or lessen macular degeneration. So they underwent, they took a lot of people, thousands, and they gave them these different supplements, and some didn't have it, and they found that uh, those that had the supplements, the vitamins, did much better than the ones that didn't. They followed them for about six years. So from this uh, study, we've now recommend vitamins. Before, we didn't we weren't sure, but now we have good hard proof that uh, vitamins lessen the chance of worsening of uh, macular degeneration by about 25%. That's pretty big, actually, if you can you know, reduce it, a disease, by that much. That's a significant uh, improvement. And we're actually all the scientists were relatively surprised that the, that the difference was that, that high. So um, we then, there's uh, suspicion that uh, omega-3 fatty acids and lutein may be helpful. Uh, most of the preparations had lutein in them already, although that was never really studied. So they decided to have an ARIDS-2 study, which is currently underway right now. Probably it will report in the next one and a half years, uh, and we're all eagerly awaiting it. In this study, they looked at using lutein and omega-3. So we really don't know for sure yet about these two things. There's a lot of sort of suspicion that they're helpful, but we don't have really the hard, hard proof uh, of this, and so we're kind of eagerly awaiting uh, to to hear about that. So, if you have dry macular degeneration, I will ask, ask you to go on to the Arids One supplement. Um, I will not. If you want to use the Arids Two, Omega Three, and and lutein, I'm not adverse to that. But until I kind of really know scientifically, I don't want to recommend that that's something you should take. If you smoke. Uh, you have, you should not be using beta carotene or vitamin A. They found in a separate study that the use of beta carotene increases your risk of lung cancer. So people who smoke and have macular degeneration, they go on to a preparation that uh, does not have beta carotene. And if you are a smoker and you say, "Well, I'm going to stop. This is too much. You know, I got to, you know, I, I want to be on all these vitamins." You have to have kind of a washout period of about two years before we feel you're really, you know, out of the risk of, of the beta carotene issue. So um, we uh, we would need to have be not smoking for two years before you go on to the regular uh, Vitalux or the regular uh, antioxidants. Now, also, usually people come in with macular degeneration with a family member. It's either a uh, child or sibling or something like that and they're usually always very quick to ask me should I get on this too and uh, my question or my answer to them is uh, is um, uh, no uh, you know this, the studies the ARID study found that only those people that actually have macular degeneration benefit from being on the vitamin supplementation 
if they want to be on vitamins, I would just generally re recommend that they go on to a multivitamin for regular vitamin supplementation um, and uh, have their eyes checked if they're in or over the age of 50 to see if they actually have the condition. Even those people with macular degeneration, they found you had to have a certain amount of it to really benefit from being on it. So there's sort of a level where we grade your macular degeneration and see if it's something that you should be taking. And uh, just kind of getting nearer to the end here, um, are lasers still used in treatment of macular degeneration? Um, I've been in practice 18 years. I've actually seen quite a few different treatments for macular degeneration. It's been quite interesting, the journey to where we are today and probably the things we're using today and five or ten years ago, and I can't believe we were using those things. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's a progression of improvement in the treatment of this condition. The condition has really exploded uh, as far as the research and the advances that are, are actually taking place in macular degeneration. It's a very exciting field to be in as far as there's a lot of new stuff that's coming, and uh, it seems to be getting better and better at every, uh, at every uh, new discovery. So uh, lasers, we still do use them occasionally, but the indications for this are much less. Um, usually in the old days, we used to burn these leaking vessels up with laser. It was not so bad if it wasn't right at your center vision, um, but the chance of it recurring was very high. Um, if it was right at the center vision, we found it better to burn it with a laser than to let the, the disease progress naturally because the outcome would be worse. So it was very hard convincing people during those times that I'm going to do a laser on your eye and I'm going to burn out your center vision, but this is better than just letting it go on its own. It's a, it's a tough conversation to have, and people after the, they've had it done, don't you know, they don't get a real warm feeling about it, you know. So uh, so it's uh, it's still used. We use it in, usually in those uh, indications where the disease is not right in or around the center of your vision, uh, but it is very rarely used. We also had a treatment just before our most current treatment where we used a, a cold laser and injected a, a special uh, medication into your, uh, uh, into your uh, venous system. It concentrated in the eye, and we activated it with a laser. Again, there are certain still subtypes of uh, macular degeneration where we still will use this uh, medication. It um, was better than burning the eye up with the laser, uh, but um, it's not as good as our current treatments. So what is the current treatment for wet macular degeneration? Well, the current treatment involves uh, anti-VEGF medications. This is a general term for a class of drug that um, reduces the or blocks the uh, uh, effects of um, VEGF. VEGF is, stands for, we have a lot of abbreviations in ophthalmology, and just because our words are very long and we don't like to say them all the time, but VEGF is a, is a chemical mediator that the uh, body releases to grow blood vessels and create leakage, and it's called vascular endothelial growth factor. So these medications block the effects of this, which is one of the prime drivers of these blood vessels growing under the retina and leaking fluid and bleeding under the retina. So these medications try to stop that leakage or mop it up. Uh, when we talk to patients, we talk about reducing the fluid that's leaking underneath the retina. So we have two types. There's... Uh, or we have two of these uh, right now. A third one's about to come on, uh, available probably in the next year. Uh, the two that we have are Avastin and Lucentis. You've probably heard these names. They're virtually, we feel that their efficacy is about the same. They both work equally well. Uh, there's some slight differences in their structure, and uh, there's some potential differences in their side effect profile, but there's controversy about this. The interesting thing is that these drugs are quite different in their cost, and this makes a lot of interesting dilemmas for us in healthcare and government policy. So, um, but the good news is that they do work very well, and uh, um, they reduce uh, this leakage uh, in the eye. We can 
actually stabilize vision 95% of the time. That means prevent it from getting worse. We have about a 30 to 40% chance to get improvement in vision. This is a revolutionary thing. In any of our treatments in the past, we've only been able to reduce how much vision is lost. Vision was always lost. We never talked about gains in vision, so now we actually have something that we can improve vision. So we are ecstatic about this. Our patients are ecstatic. But it comes with a bit of a price, and that is, one, the cost of the drug, and two, is the frequency and route of administration. So um, this, these drugs need to be injected into the eye. They need to be injected generally every month. Um, we try to use techniques where we can lessen the number of treatments by uh, various treatment uh, methodologies, such as treating and then extending or just using as-necessary treatment. But all of this, we know that the best treatment is to get it every month. So that's a big burden for the, you, the patient, especially if you don't live a block from my office. Um, it's also a big burden for us. There's a lot of patients with this disease. We talked about it. It's the most common cause of blindness over the age of 50. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's created uh, certainly some, some issues with uh, capacity. But it is an excellent treatment, and uh, our patients are very uh, hap- are happy to have it, and we're ecstatic to be able to give it to them. Are there any side effects or risk with these new injections? So, you know, patients, you know, when you first tell them that they need a needle in their eye, they're just, you know, they think you're joking. <laughs> They don't, uh, they're not expecting this, and uh, the sooner the medication is given, the better for the eye, so it's usually the same day. Uh, it's all pretty shocking, and uh, you know, but um, it's surprising what you can do when you have to, and uh, in, in the old days, the eye was quite a sacrosanct organ. People don't like anything around their eye, and it's difficult to, you know, to, to broach and embrace the fact that you need to have this needle quite frequently. Uh, the drawbacks, there is a small risk of infection. That's the main risk to the eye. Fortunately, it's very rare. It's about 1 in 3,000 injections. So your chance of getting it is very small. But uh, it is possible. We do everything we can to prevent that. We use uh, s- sterile techniques. We use anti-infective uh, surface agents. Interesting enough, it was it's felt now that antibiotics are not necessary before or after. They don't change the risk of in, or the rate of infection, so it's a lot of cost for the patient and the system, and it can actually even build up, um, kill the weak bacteria and leave the stronger ones. So there may actually be some detriment to using antibiotics after. So we've actually stopped at our office uh, using these a, a few years ago, and uh, the rates of infection haven't changed. Um, Between the two drugs, I mentioned there's controversy about whether there's more risks with one versus another, and uh, I don't think that that's been conclusive yet as to um, whether there's any significance to this. Uh, There were some increased gastrointestinal issues with Avastin over Lucentis, but for the most part, um, you know, the significance to the eye or the patient is really not known yet. So it's an area that we're keeping a very close watch on. Uh, just the last couple of few things uh, I just wanted to mention. I, you know, a lot of patients that do have a wet or a, a end-stage macular degeneration, either wet or dry, uh, will often say to me that they're seeing hallucinations, and um, and they can be a formed image, you know, a, a kid on a swing or a flower or a pattern or whatever. And they're quite bothered by this, and they think that they're going crazy, and they ask me, am I going crazy? And, uh, and I say, no, this is a very well-known phenomenon in people with um, reduced vision, particularly central vision, that when the eye is not seeing a what it thinks it should see, it can often pop an image in there um, from somewhere you know, in the past or even a pattern that just comes up uh, de novo. And... Um, you know, this is a condition called Charles Bonnet syndrome, and uh, so I, I, I reassure them that no, they're not crazy. It's just something that can happen, and uh, just let it pass. And uh, the other, the last question I was going to talk about is uh, that I often get is, and patients are very worried when they have macular degeneration. They they want to know are they going to lose their sight, and by that they mean all their sight. Their vision goes completely black, and they see no light. And fortunately, with macular degeneration, although it does cause a lot of 
damage to the visual system. It's mostly central. Uh, it's very, very rare to lose uh, peripheral vision with this condition. It is possible, but it's very, very rare. I only see it a couple times a year where someone has a massive hemorrhage under the retina that can take even away their peripheral vision. But most patients are left with good peripheral vision, and uh, this vision is usually good enough to uh, go through the da uh, daily functioning activities. Uh, they're able to take care of themselves. They're able to uh, mobilize to get around. And uh, I generally tell them that, no, your chance of going blind is very, 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 very small. You'll always usually be able to take care of yourself. And they're very comforted by this, and uh, I think that it's important for us in the healthcare profession to you know, to give people honest uh, um, hope and evaluation when when that is a, when that's possible. So that's kind of all the c questions I came up with or wanted to say. I'm happy to answer any other questions that uh, the people have. Yes, uh, here, we'll just give you a mic. Well, you say where you are. We'll give you a microphone. Um, the retinist I'm seeing says nothing more can be done for me. I am 90 years old, so should I just throw in the towel and call it quits? <laughs> uh, do you have macular degeneration? Yes. Yes. I had one eye injected. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's... Um, it's uh, The answer to that is, you know, I would... I would uh, trust what your retinal specialist is telling you. I, uh, I said I would trust what your retina specialist is telling you that if they think they uh, can't uh, improve things anymore, if they think things are as stable as they can get them, that's probably the truth. Um, it's uh, with these medications, um, as I said, they're way better than anything we've ever had in the past. Uh, but. We can only get stabilization 95% of the time and improvement in 40%. So everybody wants to be in the 40%. Um, I have to constantly kind of tell patients or remind patients that it's really still good to be in the 95% too. And so, um, you know, I think at this point, uh, um, if you've been getting the injections, that's sort of the best we have. And so uh, there's... It didn't help. Yeah. So you're probably in the 95% where it just kind of kept it but didn't didn't improve it. So there are, as I mentioned earlier, there is a new medication that's coming uh, uh, available. Arids. The Arids vi uh, vitamins, yes. Yeah, there's a new injectable medication that's very much like the Avastin and Lucentis, only it's a little stronger, uh, called Ilea. And uh, it will be coming available probably in the next uh, year to year and a half. Um, and uh, that is one that we'll probably end up trying to use in people like yourself that have had um, maximal treatment with the current treatments and have only been able to you know, achieve a certain amount of, of stabilization. We only use these medications, though, if um, there's leaking in the retina. So if the leaking stops, then there's usually not other things we can do at this point. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Hi. Yeah, I just had a, a question uh, concerning the the differences between Avastin and uh, Lucentis. Um, I guess based on my anecdotal evidence, I had um, I think significantly better results uh, with Avastin than uh, Lucentis, mm -hmm. and I'd be curious to know if there are any clinical trials out there that are actually uh, testing if there are any differences, significant differences. Yeah, that's I mean, it's a great, great um, comment and uh, questions. Um, we, as a retina community, have been sort of struggling this with this since we were, you know, blessed with both of these drugs. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not only, it's good that we have something, but, you know, we were blessed to have two, and so that it always becomes a question, is one better than the other? Should we be using one better, more than the other? Is one safer than the other? So this we've been struggling with this for the last um, number of years, ever since we had both of them, probably three, four years. Uh, and there uh, um, is actually a study where they compare the two. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence, like what you're saying to me, that you feel one works better. I have a lot of patients who've been switched from one to the other, and uh, they feel 
half feel that way and half feel the new one's better. So it's, you know, it, on an individual basis, it's hard for you to know. But they did a study. They looked at actually head-to-head the two drugs. They gave them both on a monthly basis. They have asked in the Lucentis. It's called the CAT trial, C-A-T-T, and uh, it's a large study in the uh, uh, from the National Institute of Health in the States um, that uh, will just release their two-year results, and they found that they were looking to see the history of the drugs is that Lucentis was the drug that the company wanted to develop and have approved, only it's quite a bit more expensive. Avastin is there, made by the same company for systemic uses for treating cancers. So at a time, uh, there was a time when we didn't have access to Lucentis, but Avastin was available. And so we as retina doctors knew how good this stuff was that we wanted it now, and we started injecting the Avastin into the eye and found it did a great job. And so at a fraction of the price, you're getting the, a very good medication, and this is where a lot of the controversy came from. So um, so these two drugs needed to be compared. And uh, so this trial, the CAT trial, looked at both of them, and their main thing was to see whether or not Avastin was inferior to Lucentis because it was sort of the second drug to be used in this, and it was being used off-label. And they found that, no, it was not inferior. Um, they found statistically that that um, it was not inferior. And so does that mean it's the same? Mm, probably not. Um, by all the parameters that they measure, um, the effect of it, it's maybe just you know a little bit under Lucentis, but still very, very much the same. So they're... they're ability to improve vision after two years the lucentis has eight letters like a line of vision is considered to be five letters so you know, a line and a half or a little more and the uh avastin was uh, was 7.5 so you know it's it's pretty close sure so so the answer is they're probably for all intents and purposes the same effect but, you know, that doesn't mean that in one individual, one may seem to work better than the other. Hi. Um, my question is, um, I've, I've heard and read and understood that there are some uh, researchers uh, doing uh, stem cell, adult stem cell, um, and there was an indication that they would be using, um, I think it was Dr. Van de Koy was involved with some of that, but um, where they're putting uh, a stem cell onto a uh, contact lens. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was wondering what kind of progress that might have. Uh, yeah, that's a great question, too. Um, st- so st- stem cell research, you know, has been around for, you know, again, a, significantly for, the, you know, the last uh, 10 years or so. And uh, there's been a lot of hype. You know, we're using fresh new cells that, you know, can do or be anything, and they're going to repair the old damaged ones. So... The um, you know there's a lot of excitement about that a lot of hype it's it's almost like rebuilding your eye or rebuilding your organ or whatever you need to get fixed and so um, it's it comes with a lot of uh, promise but um, in as far as macular degeneration and in the retina uh, the way they've been going at it is injecting these cells underneath the retina generally speaking and. The results have been kind of iffy so far. You know, there's uh, we can technically do it. Uh, we're we're ta- we have the equipment and expertise to put these cells under the retina, but are they actually doing any good? And they and the the jury, I think, is still out there. There has not been the wow. You know, it's it's stopping dry macular degeneration. It's regenerating the wet macular degeneration. Um, it's just it hasn't been doing that, and so. Unfortunately, you know, because you can technically do it, um, there are a lot of places doing it, but the research is, is not being conclusive that it's, it's helpful. So I'm still waiting to hear um, and see the studies where they're actually showing benefit, and, and it, it hasn't kind of been, been there yet. Uh, 
Well, you'd have to have like the cord blood, I think, when you're born and, and freeze it and save it. So it's still, I think, embryonic. But those people that are the blood bank or the banking of uh, embryonic cells is kind of only, is as well only being around the maybe the last 10 years. So these people are still too young to <laughs> be getting macular degeneration. But um, it'll be interesting to see when that time comes. But uh, you know, it's just where it hasn't. We were hoping it would be better than it is, put it that way. So it's just not really come to fruition yet.